Hi, everyone. My name is Angus Cox, and I'm a sophomore here at Yale College studying English, as well as a student guide at the Yale Center for British Art. Welcome to More Than Meets the Eye, Imagination and Recollection in British Art. This presentation is an installment in the Center's reframed video series. Today, we'll look at four paintings from the Yale Center for British Arts collection that deal with imagination and subvert expectations. In particular, through a close examination and some added context, each work reveals itself in surprising, even unusual ways. So let's dive into it with our first painting, um, Ford Maddox Brown's The Irish Girl, painted in 1860. Ford Maddox Brown, born in 1821, was an English painter associated with the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, which was a loose association of artists who sought to restore the direct and faithful representation of 14th and 15th century Italian painting. In this context, the portrait of the Irish girl might seem like just a feat of purely technical proficiency, and it might seem like Brown's goal was to paint a girl that we see here as accurately as possible, whether or not her appearance reveals any sort of moralistic message. But focusing on our theme of imagination, we can try to figure out what more we can and can't know. Brown encountered this particular girl when looking for models for his deeply moralistic painting titled Work, which we see here, in which Brown attempts to represent the entirety of class in English society and champions industriousness over traditional hierarchy. To that end, along this narrow street, which is inconveniently disrupted by the work going on in the center of it, each of these social classes are forced literally to rub up against each other to, as they evade the roadwork. We see aristocrats at the top of the painting, the manual laborers in the middle, intellectuals on the right-hand side, vendors and drunks next to the workers, and a flower vendor and evangelist on the left-hand side. Brown tended and liked to juxtapose, juxtapose contradicting details in his work. So for instance, we see on the left here, strikers and intellectuals, or on the right, a flower seller, which Brown wrote in his diary, represents a sort of effeminate gentleness on the one hand, but also stands next to a poster announcing highway robbery. The flower vendor occupies the opposite of the social scale from the woman behind him, um, and so just as Brown is critical of the lack of industriousness by the orphans and the flower sellers, so too he directs contempt for the idle rich, characterized by the woman standing behind the flower seller on the left here, whose job, in quotes, is to be seen, and the aristocrats on horses uh, shown at the right here and on the top of the frame in the painting, who, if we look at the whole painting again, we imagine they will physically have a difficult time crossing the work site on horseback. Perhaps this says something about their accessories, making it difficult for them to interact with or face the rest of society. So this painting seems to be a sort of inversion of nobility, where the subjects on the edges of the frame are traditionally understood nobility, and they're literally stopped in their tracks by the romanticized workers in front of them and in the center of the painting. Even the dogs have something to say. The dog on the right lying down gazes with annoyance up at the dog on the left because, as Brown writes quite dramatically, he hates, quote, minions of aristocracy in jackets. There are many other figures and impressions laid out in this painting, but the point stands that Ford Maddox Brown has a particular interest in representing the various types of people who exist in society, but also does so not in a purely descriptive way, but with a compositional eye towards championing a certain sort of active and industrious life. So what then should we make of the Irish girl who is not painted in any context, but rather almost blends into the background behind her? She is clearly looking with interest at something, but we have no clue as to what it may be that has her more interested in the world around her than the painter in front of her. On the right here, we see the English boy, which is an 1860 painting of Ford Maddox Brown's five-year-old son. The two paintings were meant to be hung up side by side, 
just as we see here in this orientation. These portraits mirror each other in many ways. For instance, the girl is holding a cornflower, signaling that she is a flower girl and that this is her job, whereas the boy is holding a toy in his right hand and just off of the crop on his left hand side is holding a whip. Um, these are signs of recreation. The boy is wearing a button-up dress, whereas the girl is wrapped in a weathered paisley shawl. The thicker and heavier brush strokes on the girl's clothing are contrasted with the finely worked smock over the boy's shirt. The color of the girl's clothing causes her to bend in, blend into the background, whereas the boy stands distinctly out from it. To my eyes, at least, there's a distinct difference in their gaze, too. Not only is the Irish girl glancing off to the side, but her eyes are a little bit less wide than the boys, and they look to, to me almost a little bit skeptical versus the sort of wide-eyed naivete with which the boy looks directly at the, the viewer of the painting. Um, there is, of course, a, a distinct or, or very overt national difference in the titles between these two paintings, the Irish girl on the one hand and the English boy on the other. Um, these paintings were painted less than a decade after Ireland's potato famine, in which Ireland's population decreased by nearly 25%, and in which the English government was largely unresponsive. This perhaps gives us a plausible explanation for the Irish girl's distracted gaze, which certainly looks like a longing or pondering sort of glance, um, perhaps at a child who she understands to live a profoundly different life than she does. So, how should we understand the message of Brown's depiction of this girl, then? There's no evidence that this portrait was of particular significance to Brown. There's no mention in his diary of this girl or this painting. But I think that whether or not Brown meant the Irish girl as a moralistic or purely descriptive painting, her features, her posture, and facial expression are so evocative that we can't help but take an interest in and identify with her. And in considering what she is looking at beyond the picture frame and what she herself might be imagining there, we begin to fill in the picture of the world around her. Now, from a small painting with very little explicit content, we go to the exact opposite. This is Joseph Wright of Darby's The Blacksmith Shop, painted in 1771. Wright, born in 1734, is best known for painting moon and candlelit scenes that tend to paint, sort of de depict romanticized heroic versions of various human activities. On the face of it, this looks like a fairly standard scene. Perhaps it's a bit dramatic, but it appears to be a faithful depiction of life in the blacksmith shop. And before he ever painted this scene, Wright actually already had a vivid idea of a painting just like this one. He wrote that he wanted to paint a scene that, that depicts two, quote, two men forming a bar of iron into a horseshoe from whence the light must proceed. He mentions an idle fellow that stands by the anvil in a time-killing posture, his hands in his bosom, or yawning with his hands stretched upwards with a little twisting of the body. But upon further examination, certain details show that there is much more to this painting than just a simple industrial scene that Wright had been meaning to paint for a long time. For instance, the setting. This scene does not appear to take place in a traditional stone structure, but instead, this forge seems to be an abandoned church with its nave and gable roof. And to, to further hammer this point home, we see an angel sculpted into the walls of the smithy, not something that you would traditionally see. We might even notice that the central scene is reminiscent of Jesus's nativity and the adoration paintings that celebrate it. Much has been made in analysis of Wright's painting of these obvious compositional similarities. Um, here are examples by Georges de la Tour and Gerald von Honhorst. Um, we see people huddled around the bastion of hope that is literally glowing with potential and possibility, just as in Wright's painting. Also, this painting is compositionally reminiscent of Wright's Academy by Lamplight, as if to place it on the same level of importance as academic and artistic work. 
Indeed, a painter is sort of a combination of these two representations, conjuring up visions and notions in their head before painstakingly realizing them on the canvas. One thing to note is that there is far too much light coming from the ingot in this scene, or this is to say far much, far, far more light than there would be if this were a photograph, say. Um, this is no doubt in part a compositional issue. Um, we wouldn't be able to see anything if the scene were so-called properly lit, um, but there's another element at play here as well. Um, during an inspection of this painting, a gold leaf was found and discovered under the paint of the, on the canvas, right where the ingot is painted over. Um, while the actual gold leaf itself likely does very little to illuminate the painting, it symbolizes the importance that Wright attached to this sort of image. In this sense, the light may represent the outsized importance that the act of smithing has on its surroundings, um, the walls and faces nearby, as we see here. And what should we make of the other subjects in this painting? What do the idle fellow and the child cowering away from the ingot add to the scene? Perhaps our idle fellow is here to emphasize the benefit of this industriousness and highlight its use for everybody, particularly those who rely on others' physical labor. So too, the child we see here who is turning away to shield his face from the flaming sparks draws attention to the difficulty of this work. By furnishing these craftsmen in the image of classical heroes, then, Wright has imagined a seemingly mundane scene into one of serious physical and moral importance, and expresses the sublime moment of creation in each ordinary object. He has also transformed what seems like a fairly true representation into something almost approaching the divine. Painted nearly two and a half centuries after Joseph Wright's The Blacksmith Shop, we see Kehinde Wiley's portrait of Lynette Yadam Boachi after Jacob Moreland of Capilwaith. Kehinde Wiley, born in 1977, completed his MFA at the Yale School of Art in 2001, and here depicts fellow contemporary artist Lynette Yadam Boachi for his series Trickster, which is composed of portraits of Black contemporary artists in backgrounds derived from classical European portraits. This makes it the first portrait that we have looked at of a person familiar to the artist, unlike the unnamed Irish girl that Ford Maddox Brown stumbled upon or Joseph Wright's imagined blacksmiths. Yadam Boachi, also born in 1977, is a British painter and writer. She predominantly paints portraits of imaginary figures in front of dark and ambiguous backgrounds in an attempt to avoid association with a specific setting or time period. She cites found images and memory as the inspiration for these improvisational paintings. Here are some of her paintings, Curses, painted in 2011, and Complication, painted in 2013. This particular Kehinde Wiley painting recalls George Romney's portrait of Jacob Moreland of Capilwaith, painted in 1763. When you look at these two paintings side by side, they're essentially compositionally identical. The trees and grass in the foreground are precisely the same, and so too are the respective skies and backgrounds. Romney's painting is a little less active than Wiley's, however. The gun and the dog may suggest that a hunt is imminent, but Wiley's painting gives confirmation. Yadam Boachi stands above dead rabbits and holds the rifle as if ready to fire again at any moment. This is clearly a painting in which action has occurred and may occur again. Wiley's painting seems to be painted at a slightly lower angle than Romney's, which gives Yadam Boachi a more candid, even aloof appearance in comparison with her 18th century counterpart, who looks more static and posed. Part of Wiley's work in reimagining this scene is, of course, historical. In 18th century England, only landowners were allowed to own guns or to hunt, so these characteristics of nobility are reimagined and reclaimed for a new historical moment. The notion of the trickster, as well, is an interesting one. Traditionally, we think of a trickster as a clever, slightly mischievous figure who uses their skills to cause some sort of disruption. Wiley describes each of the artists painted in this series as tricksters in some way, 
because each of their respective works in some way plays with or subverts what is expected or what is traditional. But in another sense, Wiley's familiarity with Yadam Boachi is crucial here. Wiley may be painting other tricksters, but by painting Yadam Boachi as he does, he is doing precisely the same thing. He is taking a real person, painted with precise detailing, and critically grounding, grounding them in a certain, uh, certain given anachronistic place and time. The necessity of setting and the stationary clarity of the figure contrasts very directly with Yadam Boachi's own art, which emphasized his movement and ambiguity, as previously mentioned. This creates several layers of imagination, imagination subverting both classical English portraiture through a di distortion of time, but also subverting Yadam Boachi's own work. Perhaps Wiley is the real trickster here. His use of these various facets of imagination operate on both a zoomed out historical and social level and on an interpersonal one, interfacing directly with the subject. And last, but certainly not least, we arrive at our final painting, our first non-figurative one, Joseph Mallard William Turner's Inverary Pier, Loch Fine, Morning. And this is just an aside, but it's typical of Turner paintings to be named precisely what we're looking at. So here, this is Inverary Pier, which is on Loch Fine, Loch translating to lake, and it's morning. Born in 1775, Turner lived until 1851, and so this is among his final few paintings. The abstracted forms are characteristic of Turner's later work, in contrast with some of the more realistic portrayals that we will look at in a second. Throughout his career, though, Turner tended to focus more on his impression of a scene rather than strictly adhering to the observable details. John Constable was generally a great admirer of Turner's, but they had a long-standing and fairly petty rivalry, and in a particularly heated moment, Constable once criticized Turner's work as, quote, just steam and light. Now, although Constable meant this as a rebuke, it's actually a fairly apt description. Turner had an incredible eye for experimentation, and he, in my mind at least, is the painter who best depicts motion in a static medium. This artistic experimentation was made possible by Turner's great success in his early career. Um, he was accepted into the Royal Academy of Arts, aged just 14, and his first painting to appear in an exhibition there was only a year later. So Turner's work was popular, was a popular and critical success essentially from the outset. And he felt free to try new techniques and stray away from previous stylistic choices. Um, in this painting, it's hard to point out exactly what each shape represents and colors bleed from water to land and vice versa, which confuses us even more. I find that when viewed from close range, it can get particularly hard to understand what exactly we're looking at. So here are each of the four corners. This is the top left. It's pretty hard, I would say, to make out exactly what's going on here. Um, here is the top right. Again, we see perhaps a gradient of a sky, but it's, it's generally very hard to tell. Here's the bottom left. Um, again, it's not clear that this is the shoreline at all if we just focus on this part and the bottom right, which is perhaps the most abstract of them all, I would not think that this is just purely a seascape. But when we view the whole thing, these forms become much more clear. This painting also didn't always look like this. It went through several iterations and has, was over 40 years in the making. Its story takes us back to 1801 in Inverary in Scotland. Turner often went on tours of the British Isles in search of inspiration and occasionally specific scenes to paint. In 1801, Turner embarked on a trip to Scotland and made a stop in the town of Inverary, specifically at the request of John Campbell, the seventh Duke of Argyll, to depict life in the city and the Inverary Castle, the seat of the Duke of Argyll. This is here we see um, Inverary Castle. Inverary is a bit of a strange town, in many ways sort of an artificial one. The new Inverary castle, the one that we were just looking at, or knew at the time at least, was built by the third Duke of Argyll in the mid-18th century. 
Um, when the castle was built, the Duke insisted that the city be demolished and built a short ways away from the castle, the new site, to provide him with more privacy. And so the Duke built a planned city all at once, and residents were essentially rehoused. There was a sharp increase in population as the industry was created along with these new building projects rather than naturally arrived at in any way. This effect, in fact, was so strong and strange that visitors at the time described reaching Inverary and feeling as if they had stumbled onto the set of a play rather than into the center of a functional town. At the time of the trip, Turner was particularly interested in presenting work to the Royal Academy and was looking intently for scenes to provide that pre presentable work. This fact and his commission by the Duke of Argyle are reflected in the details of these initial sketches. He often used watercolor in his early career before switching predominantly to oil paint. This is one of a few sketches that Turner made from observation on his visit to Inverary. Here, the castle is depicted in the background, but still stands out against the natural colors of rural Scotland. This bright white emanates from the center of the painting, almost as if it is a sort of beacon or reference point amidst the natural scene around it. Here we have another observational sketch, this time highlighting the industry and the activity of the town, but still representing the figures and goings on fairly vividly. This is the second iteration of that, created 10 years after the first, and it's not particularly different. Turner had not been back to Inverary since the 1801 visit, and although he works with a different medium here, this is an etching using mezzotint rather than a watercolor as we saw earlier, um, we see approximately the same figures and the same natural details at play here. Um, here are the two images superimposed on each other just to highlight their compositional similarity. The aspect ratios are a little different, but it's no doubt that it's a reworking of that initial sketch. The details have changed very little. But then we get to the final work, and we're asked to take a step back and look at the whole of the painting rather than picking out any specific details. As I mentioned before, Turner was never interested in his paintings standing as any sort of visual record of people and history. The apparent objectivity of a photograph, for instance, might look like morning on a lake in Scotland, but Turner's painting attempts to feel like that morning. Of course, sitting on the banks of Loch Fyne, you would never see this, but that really is beside the point. Although his commission came from the Duke of Argyle, who no doubt expected Turner to be taken with the beauty of the built environment, and in, particularly, in particular the newly completed castle, 40 years since he saw Inverary firsthand, a different memory of the town remained in Turner's mind. The white gleaming castle is nowhere to be seen, and even the boats and the fishermen that we had just seen in the sketch that became this final painting have faded away. Over the course of time, Turner seems to have become more attached to a emotional, perhaps even more spiritual memory of the shapes and colors of Inverary. And it's important to mention here that this painting is also almost certainly unfinished. In fact, so is actually a large portion of Turner's late work. And while we tend to understand his later career as a turn in a more abstract, even proto-modernist direction, perhaps, much of these stylistic distinctions may just come down to a less glamorous explanation. Turner never, never publicly displayed a work with as few discernible forms as this one, and he was known to work on paintings even up to a few days before they were set to be shown. So had this work ever left Turner's studio during his lifetime, it would have almost certainly been altered in some way. Some people consider this fact worthy of essentially disqualifying Inverary Pier and the other contemporaneous works from critical analysis. They say that if Turner would have added other elements to the canvas, how can we conclude that this is the image and message that he meant to convey? Although this point is well taken, the truth is that this is what we have. And I think that there is something sort of beautiful about that. It does not prevent us from seeing what is in the painting and taking those choices seriously, but it also extends the realm of imagination from the artist to us. Rather than thinking about this unfinished work as less than in some way, we have an opportunity to treat it as an invitation. 
As we imagine what Turner may have added and consider how close the painting may be to its final state, we are maybe subconsciously invited to reveal what we would like to imagine in the painting, inflected by the certain ways that it makes us feel. We might encounter someone on the street, for instance, and imagine them fitting into this landscape as a wanderer or as a fellow observer. Or we may even picture an addition that transforms this almost a dreamlike environment that Turner creates with an active heroic foreground. Or perhaps we will see our friends and colleagues in the image of Turner's Inverary Pier and consider the unlikely ways that they might fit in or stand out from his created world. And it's not just because Turner's painting is unfinished that we have this power to imagine. The same could be said about any of these other paintings and how we could imagine the others influencing them. Across different centuries and different purposes, each of the artists here, Ford Maddox Brown in The Irish Girl, Joseph Wright of Darby in The Blacksmith Shop, Gehinde Wiley's Portrait of Lynette Yadam Boachi, and J.M.W. Turner's Inverary Pier, each of these artists has taken familiar or recognizable scenes from life and variously altered them in accordance with their visions of the subjects and of the world. And so, as we look at and form our own thoughts and opinions around them, we begin to do the same. Thank you.